Okay, what was that? And why are we covered in hydraulic oil? Well, let's go back a bit and let me explain. This is a metal 3D printed pump housing and it's made to replace all of this. Well, maybe not this exact system, but something like this. You know, a big complex system with lots of pipes and valves and stuff, and replace it with a single 3D printed part. This would reduce both the weight and the size of the system. And with this type of technology, we would be able to make rockets fly higher, race cars go faster, and most importantly, get closer to this idea of being able to download and print a car at home. So let's have a closer look at this 3D printed pump housing. It's made to be as small and light as humanly possible, and it includes everything from the housing itself, to distribution blocks, to optimized channels, and ugh, these huge attachment points for check valves. I mean, yes, currently this is the best way of putting a check valve into a 3D printed part. But it makes you wonder, how much smaller and lighter could we build this thing if all the check valves would just be built in? Or should I say, printed in? Printed in place. In. The function of a check valve is to let fluids go in one direction, but not the other. If you've been around on the internet, you're probably already saying, but wait, we already have something like that. It's called a Tesla valve. And they are indeed a very popular choice for 3D printing. However, those are very big and bulky if you want them to work well, and even under ideal conditions, they leak. Besides, a check valve has only like two parts. How hard can it be to make it fully printable? And with that one statement, I managed to seal my fate for the next six months of my life. But hey, at least I got some really cool solutions out of it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's keep watching. The check valves that we're trying to replace are designed to withstand up to 400 bars, which is about 200 times higher than what you can find in a normal car tire. So if we want to replace it with a 3D printed part, we have to turn to metal, as in metal 3D printing. We are going to be using the laser powder bed fusion also known as SLM 3D printing. Imagine that this is an SLM 3D printer. The way it works is that a very thin layer of powder is first drawn across the already printed part, then the laser goes over the powder and melts it in specific areas. Finally, the build platform is lowered together with the printed part and the excess powder. Following this, the cycle repeats until the part is finished. If you're doing this in real world, it looks something like this. The laser goes over the already printed parts, then, the build platform goes down a little bit, the recoater recoats a thin layer of powder over the already existing parts, and finally the laser goes over it again, creating an infinite cycle. Knowing all of this, you've probably already noticed that this functions in a very similar manner to the much cheaper plastic printing SLS process. You're now probably thinking, oh sweet, I can save myself half a million dollars, but I can just buy one of those relatively cheap SLS printers slap on a huge ass laser and 3D print metal parts. Essentially, yeah, but in practice, not really. There are more differences between SLS and SLM other than the power of the laser. Even if you somehow would be able to run a metal melting, high power laser to your SLS machine without burning it to the ground, heat management will still be an issue. Which brings us on to why I brought this up. There are several limitations in the SLM printing process that we need to know about and understand to be able to work around them. Just like water that needs to cool down to become ice, molten metal needs to cool down to become solid. It does this by dissipating its heat through the already printed part and build plate. However, if your part has a very very steep overhang, only a small amount of heat is able to dissipate through the already printed part, and the rest tries to dissipate through the powder, which sadly is a very good insulator, which means the part is not able to cool down in time. This can cause very rough surfaces and degraded material properties. This is the main reason for why you cannot just print parts in midair. Without physical contact to the build plate, the metal will not cool down in time, causing the print to fail, possibly damaging the machine, and who knows, maybe worse. So this leaves us with a problem. The check valve plunger needs to be able to move relative to the housing. However, the plunger also needs to be attached to the housing to be able to be printed. So we can design a check valve that works, but is unprintable, or we can design a check valve that is printable, but doesn't work. Not ideal. However, we can get around it. The solution to the problem is to use support structures. These create a physical connection between the part that is being printed and the build plate itself, allowing for the part to cool down and solidify. 
After the print is done, Mr. Dremel and Mr. Clippy will make these support structures an offer they can't refuse and remove them. However, this leaves us with another problem. The most obvious way of creating a check valve would be to print it with the support structures and then remove the support structures after printing. However, since this check valve is inside of a hydraulic system, physical support removal will be difficult, if not impossible. Another way of getting around this problem is to print most of the housing, pause the print, insert a plunger and a retaining ring, and then just keep on printing from there. However, this isn't completely print in place, so I would consider it cheating. There's simply too much human interaction in the build process. So, what do we do if we don't want to cheat? The design I use has no angles that are steeper than 45 degrees. So the only support structures that we need to use and later remove are the ones that connect to the plunger. Another thing you might notice is that the plunger uses a square stem and the walls of the housing look a lot thicker than the ones on a commercial check valve. This is because the plan is not only to test if 3D printed check valves are manufacturable, but also to test if exposing these to very high pressures will increase the sealing performance of the check valve that uses hard metal sealing surfaces. You can imagine this as Play-Doh being pushed against an uneven surface and by deformation creating a very good seal. You're probably noticing that this design does not have a spring, nor the possibility to insert one. And while it's not necessary for a check valve to function, it does limit its use cases and it also affects its response performance. So with that in mind, I designed this. This is what I call the cantilever check valve. It is called that because when you saw it open, you will see that there's a sealing body at the end of a cantilever. When printed, the cantilever is held straight by support structures. But during printing, internal stresses build up due to thermic uh, expansion and contraction. This is very similar to warping in FDM 3D printing. These stresses can be imagined as tapes that are stretched and stacked on top of each other and create an upwards bend. When the support structures are removed, you end up with a cantilever that acts as a spring for the sealing body. And thereby we have created a spring-loaded check valve that is completely print in place. So for those of you who keep count, I've introduced a check valve that is not really print in place and is kind of cheating. And I've introduced two check valves that require support removal, but without physical access to the supports. So how do we remove these support structures? Due to the parts being a hydraulic part, we can simply use acids in the channels to remove the support structures. If we are printing with aluminium, we can use sodium hydroxide, which creates an exothermic reaction when it comes in contact with aluminium. This is a very fast and efficient way of removing material. If we want more strength out of our prints, we have to use stainless steel. Dissolving that requires nitric acid and hydrochloric acid, both of which will put you on some sort of a government list if you try to get it off the internet. Luckily, if you acquire these through a university, not only will you no longer be considered a danger to society, but you will actually receive a discount on buying them. The most important component of stainless steel is chrome because if there's enough free chrome molecules in the surface of the stainless steel, it will create an oxide layer that protects the underlying metal from agents that would usually dissolve it. For instance, nitric acid. On the other hand, this oxide layer can be dissolved by hydrochloric acid. And with a mixture of the two, you'll be able to dissolve stainless steel without any problems. Good job, you two. Except we end up with a small problem. When you dissolve steel like this, you do not get uniform dissolution, which means all the careful planning you put into the geometry of your valve is right out the window because it looks like a piece of Swiss cheese. And to make matters worse, the support structures are still there. Ah, anyway, we have a way around the problem. Let me show you. We want to be able to remove exactly half the width of a support structure of every single surface in the part. So if our support structures are 0.2 millimeter wide, we want to remove exactly 0.1 millimeter from all the surfaces. This way, we can remove the support structures entirely and every other surface we can compensate for in the design. By exposing the stainless steel to a carbon and nitrogen rich environment, where the carbon and nitrogen are actually really, really small particles, under high temperature, these are able to sneak in or diffuse into the steel, where when they they are able to create chrome carbides and chrome nitrites. This is great for two reasons. First of all, it creates a layer that can be dissolved by nitric acid. And second of all, it's a process that's so easy to control, even I could do it. So 
Once you've taken your 3D print and sorted off the build plate, then dump your part with some sodium hexocyanoferrit into a container that you then cook for 6 hours at 800 degrees in an oven. And once it's out of the oven, you can go ahead and get some mechanical engineering ASMR. And finally, just put it in an acid bath and you're done. No, really. When the lab manager calls you furiously at 7 a.m. in the morning, asking you what the hell this rusty piece of metal in his lab is, you can tell him, don't worry, it's a self-terminating process. Once the nitric acid has dissolved all the dissolvable layers, it ends up meeting chrome, which promptly creates a passivation layer that the nitric acid can no longer penetrate, which means it stops the process. Hello? Problem solved, I guess. And because the process has stopped, you can just simply leave it there for a week or two, or however long it takes for the lab manager to throw you out of the lab forever. Which of course does not matter anymore, because now you should have a fully working check valve, where water goes through in one direction, but not the other. At this point, we can just go ahead and machine it, put some threads on it, and it's ready for testing. Sadly, the testing part of this video is going to be a little bit boring. Due to the other tests that we wanted to run on this check valve, it's designed to withstand 4000 bars. However, the pumps that it's connected to, on a good day, can do 400. So probably, this is going to be boring, we're just going to look at it, nothing's going to happen. And then we're going to look at the results afterwards, right? Oh. So, let's start with the good news. The check valve did not blow up. The bad news is, regardless of what blows up at 400 bars of pressure, you will end up with a 4 day cleanup job where you'll be scrubbing the roof. The culprit in this situation was a cutting ring that slipped off the pipe. This goes to show you should never trust a pre-made pipe. So after the cleanup, we set up the system again and put a rag over it, because you know, that will stop 400 bars of pressure if something would let go again. Luckily, we managed to reinstate the law of nature that if a camera is on, nothing interesting is going to happen. And by that, we managed to conclude all the tests. Let me abbreviate the results for you. All the check files that we tested worked as intended even if they did leak a bit at higher pressures. However, what we did see was that with every test, the check valve leaked less and less and less. Indicating that the overpressurized Play-Doh sealing method that was planned would have worked if we would have had the time and the opportunity to test this. Inspecting the sealing surfaces under a very expensive but very cool microscope that can make 3D pictures, we can see the effects that we were going for. The welding bubbles that are typical for SLM 3D printing were starting to flatten out under the pressure, and thereby creating a better sealing surface. So, where does that leave us? Sadly, you can still not download and print a car at home. Yet. However, now it's clear that a Tesla valve is not the only type of valve you can 3D print into a hydraulic system and make it work. And with the everlasting improvements in support removal processes, as well as a growing understanding of how to create sealing surfaces without machining, it's inevitable that small and lightweight, high-performance, fully 3D-printed hydraulic systems will find their way into spacecraft, race cars, and other high-performance applications very soon. So the question is, what's next? What do we do from here? Well, as for me, I'm currently looking for projects to work on. So if you or your company need any of my engineering services, please reach out. This is my background. This is my work experience. And these are the languages I speak. For any inquiries, please reach out to my business email, which you can find under the About tab on YouTube. Or reach out via any of my social media. If hiring a professional engineer wasn't exactly what you were thinking of when I said what's next, how about this? This is a check valve that is printable with the help of an FDM machine that you have at home. The check valve is designed to fit a normal garden hose. And thereby, it functions both as a great educational tool, but also as a functioning component in whatever hydraulic system you're building in your garden. I have put a lot of time and effort into optimizing the sealing surfaces, so the seals would seal as well as possible right off the printer. However, every printer is different. And it's possible that when you take it off the build plate, it might not seal perfectly. For this, I recommend using a drill to lap the two surfaces together and mate them to each other. By doing this, you will be able to achieve a very good seal. Ah, well what a shame! You just finished your hydraulics project in the garden, and you don't really need another check valve anymore. Well, don't worry. 
Mr. Snippy and Mr. Dremel will make you an offer you can't refuse. They'll make you an offer you can't refuse. Which is to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Anyway, I'm Sunshine. See you guys very soon. Bye.